Okay, it's 11 o'clock, so we're going to get started on our next topic. And we have David Wolf from the UNH uh, Testing Lab. Uh, David's a great guy, but uh, for those of you who have been out to UNH for a plug fest in the middle of winter, he's in the wrong <laughs> spot. So uh, we're going to try to get him to transfer to the University of Hawaii or something and have a nicer <laughs> plug fest than... Uh, we have in the middle of winter. So take it away, David. Yeah, thank you. Let me know how that goes. <laughs> Setting us up in Hawaii, I'd love to hear about that. Love to participate. Uh, and thank you, Carlos, for, for the introduction. So you can, I think, bump two slides ahead here. Uh, you'll see the title of this is Universal Connectivity and Interoperability in an Open Ecosystem. And there's things inherent in open networking that are making interoperability more difficult. And there are things that Carlos kind of alluded to that, you know, the traditional integrators and the traditional vendors really kind of shielded the end user from, and they had different methods for doing that. And now we're having to confront some of those interoperability issues. So I'm going to talk about some of the things that have pro cropped up at our plug fest and the testing we do at, at UNH, and then also some solutions that we've um, come up with to address these issues that are kind of unique to open networking. So of course I'm from the interoperability lab, so I care about interoperability. Uh, and interoperability is something that's really critical to establish for the open com compute project community and for, for open networking. Because at the end of the day, the customer doesn't care about how a particular protocol was implemented or if it followed the specification perfectly. What they really care about is if things are working together when they actually go to plug them together. So next slide, please. So the open networking phenomenon and the white box phenomenon has created all kinds of interesting things, new designs for data centers. You might have seen one piece recently about uh, one company that implemented a data center using uh, only one networking SKU. And you would think that using only one networking SKU would just eliminate all of your interoperability problems because it's all the same stuff. But the fact is in open networking, we've got new types of variables that even then, even when you're dealing with one uh, networking SKU, you're still gonna have uh, interoperability problems. So we're seeing new designs, uh, we're seeing new ways of implementing data centers, new ways of using networking products. Next slide. And so that's led to all kinds of new customers. So especially for the ODMs, they're being able to sell to places and to customers that they didn't have before. So where previously there was not necessarily a drought, um, now there's lots of new customers. The lake has, has filled up. So you might recognize this photo. It was circulated a lot around here to illustrate that the drought is over. But the fact is there can kind of be too much of a good thing. So let's look at the next slide. Uh, even though White Box is delivering all these new kinds of solutions and all these new kinds of customers, it's also uncovering all these problems that previously we were shielded from, right? So even though White Box enables all these neat kind of simplifications and new things that you can do, it also is introducing new problems. So next slide. The fact is that by default, and I say that by default, open does not equal interoperable. I can't tell you how many people have told us, yeah, we thought because it was open, it would just work. And kind of inside, I chuckled to myself, but that's a perception that people have, and they're being introduced to a cold reality that just because it's open, it doesn't work. They're not the same thing. And if we let that perception continue, uh, that's going to be bad for the idea of open networking. It's going to be bad for the open compute brand. And ultimately, it's going to lead to unhappy customers. So next slide. So what I'm going to do is uh, share some examples of things, of problems that illustrate that fact, illustrate that open does not equal interoperable, that they're not the same thing by default. I'm going to show you some of the problems that we've run into at the plug vest, and then talk about, well, how can we fix that as a community and what's happening at UNH to try and fix that. Uh, so our first example, this is from a plug fest, wow, two years ago now, and Carlos alluded to the fact that we've been doing this testing for about uh, two and a half years. We had a combination of one NOS, uh, one white box switch, and one optic. This was a 10 gig port. And that's kind of the, the shocking thing here. It's a 10 gig port that wasn't even cutting edge technology two years ago. And we found that that particular combination with an optical module that was borderline it wouldn't even turn on the port. Now, this was, this was one of the things that led to this uh, uh, project uh, for open optical monitoring that, that Finisar has introduced. 
And that's something that really has the potential, that project, OOM, really has the potential to, I don't know if I'd say eliminate entirely, but address and solve and find a lot of these interoperability problems that we find uh, with, with optical modules. So that was one example. Simple, uh, improper fine tuning for the board layout that you had. Um, the optic what itself was marginal, kind of on the line, and then the port itself from the ASIC out to the, the front, of the uh, front of the switch hadn't been tuned properly. Those things together, we can't turn on the port. Not a complicated problem, but nobody had looked at it before with that particular module. So we found that at the PlugFest. Next slide. This one was a little more shocking. This is from uh, August of 2016. We're doing a PlugFest for uh, 100 gig products. And we found a combination of NOS and switch that simply did not support DAX. <laughs> Which is kind of funny in a sad way that there's a huge section of the data center market that wants to be able to use DAX. And this particular combination simply wasn't turning them on. It's not, it wasn't a complicated thing. It wasn't that they didn't have the, the capability to do it. It was that they hadn't configured the bits properly. And they just had to go in there and fix them. Not a complicated problem, but plain and simple, nobody had ever looked at it before. And so this is going to be kind of a theme that you're going to see with these interoperability problems that we've uncovered. We were being protected from these problems when we were working directly with a monolithic integrator. But now, moving into a, a disaggregated environment, these kinds of problems, they're still there. They're not that complicated, but we need to go find them and dig for them and fix them. So PlugFest is a nice tool in doing that. So again, this was actually something we were able to fix that week. Uh, they were just able to go in and, and change the configurations in the NOS and they were able to support DAX. But we were very happy to be able to find that at the PlugFest rather than finding it in the field and rather having a customer find it. Next slide, please. Similar thing here. We found a case, same PlugFest, where a particular con combination of white box switch and NOS would only turn on the port if a particular brand of optic was plugged in. So much for disaggregated and open. This is the old way of doing things. And again, it's not complicated. Once we found this, hey, you know, we plugged in these four and they don't work, and we plugged in this one and it does work, it was pretty obvious what was going on. They had whitelisted the one optic. And again, they were able to go back and fix it. Even that week, we were able to go on uh, with the testing. This one stings a little bit, though, because we wish we had had our plug fest maybe just a week earlier, because that same problem, old school whitelisting of optics, was found by a big customer that same week. So we wish we had just done it just a little bit earlier. But so that's why we continued to do uh, the plug fest. So we keep uncovering these kinds of problems. Uh, one more example, and this one. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry. This is one uh, Carlos kind of alluded to a little bit with the. QSFP plus or later, or QSFP 28 or later uh, DAX. So basically, we had a case where there was a DAC vendor that was identifying themselves as QSFP plus or later. And NOSes were looking for DAX being plugged in to identify themselves in their EEPROM as QSFP 28 or later. Now, on the surface, you look at this and say, well, 100 gig DAC, it should be QSFP 28 or later, right? Because that's newer than QSFP plus. So on the surface, that logic makes sense. You can go to the next slide. However, if you actually dig into the SFF spec and look what it says about this, there's actually wording in the SFF spec that basically says, if you want to have a better shot at interoperability, especially if you're going to use that cable as a four lane 25 gig DAC rather than a single aggregated 100 gig link, you should identify yourself as QSFP plus or later. And so you think of it from the DAC company's perspective, they open up the spec and it says, basically, if you want to be interoperable, identify yourself as QSFP plus or later. And they're like, well, oh, that sounds good to us. We want to be interoperable. So that's how they program their DACs. Then they go to plug in and the NOSes won't turn it on, right? So this was a case where following the spec <laughs> uncovered an interoperability problem. Again, not complicated. You know, they had to make a decision about you know, who's going to make the change? Is it going to be the NOS vendor? Is it going to be the cable vendor? Who's going to make the change in order to enable interoperability? Again, not complicated, but we had to kind of dig and find that problem. But once we found it, it was easy to fix. Next slide, please. So 
The point is, none of these problems were, were that hard, but they're interop problems, and they're interop problems that we don't want to have come up in the field. If they come up in the field, if it's a customer that's finding them, there's going to be unhappy customers. And what does unhappy customers lead to? Next slide. Low adoption. They, we don't want to allow that perception of open, or we don't want to allow that idea of open not being interoperable to perpetuate because it's going to tarnish the brand of open compute. It's going to tar tarnish the idea of open networking. So what can we do to combat that? Next slide. We've really seen four reasons that interoperability is a special challenge when it comes to open networking. And many of these things were, again, things that were being shielded from in the more traditional monolithic uh, integrators. So first one is access to products. Uh, second is new types of interoperability variables. Third, we're dealing with an exponentially larger interoperability matrix. And then fourth, an integration resources gap. And I'm going to dig into what I mean in each of these. But these are the four things that I believe make uh, interoperability in the open environment uh, a special challenge that we need to address. So next slide. So first, access to products. Uh, if you want to test with uh, whether it be an open networking switch, an OCP switch, or an OCP server, and you're trying to connect these things, uh, you would need to have some in your lab to actually test against. So go ahead and try and do that. You're, it's easy to get some if you want to buy them in the thousands. But it can be very difficult to get some to put into your test labs. So our solution to, to this has been as the lab, as UNH, uh, to engage with, each, with these hardware uh, companies individually and encourage them to provide samples for our lab and then we'll make it available for other people to test against. That's the model that, that we're following. So rather than trying to get samples out into every single lab that's out there, put it in one place and have that be kind of a sandbox for the community to use. And that's the approach that, that, we've, that we've taken. Next slide. That other challenge, the second challenge, is new types of interop variables. So it used to be that the interoperability problems were between different boxes. Oh, I got a box from vendor A, and I got a box from vendor B, and I plug them together and they don't want to talk to each other. So that was the variable, was two different vendors. But now you're having these interoperability variables not just between the boxes, but also inside the box. So you need to have some tests that address what's going on inside the box. How is the NOS being installed onto the switch? How is that combination of NOS and switch actually talking to the, to the module or the cable? Next slide. And so uh, we've worked with the community to create a set of tests that does exactly that, focusing first on layer one interoperability. So, um, We've been publishing the Open Networking Integrators list. It first went up in October of 2015. Uh, we recently crossed over 100 configurations that are identified there and have come through the lab. And basically what this shows you is what optics and modules you can expect to work, have been proven to work, with a given combination of NOS and white box switch. So we designed the tests not just to test in between two boxes, uh, but to change the variables of what's running on those boxes and what's being plugged into those boxes. Next slide. Now we don't want to stop at layer one. We've done a lot of work on layer one. Uh, like I said, 100 configurations on the, on the integrators list. But the interoperability issues extend beyond layer one. So we've spent a lot of time on layer one. We're moving to, to layer two. I'm happy to, to say we're partnering with Agama Networks on creating some use cases for layer two. And so just as in layer one, where we identified basically the trifecta of pieces that you're going to be putting together, and let's now change each of those, uh, for layer two, we're going to set up some kind of demo reference architectures of, of switches, of networks, and then again, swap pieces out. So swap out the leaf switch, swap out the spine switch, change the software on each of those things, and run our interoperability test that way. So we're putting those tests together uh, right now. And we're going to try and put together use cases or reference architectures for the data center, for the enterprise, and also for the service provider case. So that's something that we've got coming in the future. Next slide. Uh, finally, also, uh, we're launching an ONI tested program. So ONI is a really critical piece for the idea of disaggregated networking. And so what we've done 
is put together a test program for allowing a bare metal switch vendor to come into the lab and test their compliance to, to ONI using the conformance tests that have been produced by the ONI community. And again, producing another integrators list to show ONI compliance and allowing a, a logo to go along with that so that someone's claims about support for ONI can be independently verified. Next slide. All right, our third problem is the exponentially larger interop matrix. So now that our interop variables are not just in between the boxes, but also inside the boxes, the interop matrix, the number of variables, gets really, really big really quickly. So this is just a, a simple example here. Um, if I want to plug from a given server to a given switch, that's just one link, there's a bunch of different variables there. And I don't think I've identified all of them here, but there could be different operating systems on the switch. There could be different operating systems on the servers. There could be different NICs in the server. There could be different firmware on that NIC. There could be different modules. There could be different uh, cables. All kinds of different variables. And if there's just two possibilities for each of those variables, you're up over 500 combinations if you really wanted to test all of them. Nobody's going to do that. Nobody's going to go through and test all those 500 combinations. Next slide. So what do we do? Well, Carlos talked about, well, let's not put our head in the sand. Let's not pr pretend that this problem doesn't exist just because it's big and complicated. We've got to try and do something to put a dent in it. And so the solution that we've done at the IOL is try and cast a wide net to at least capture some of the interoperability problems. And this photo kind of captures it. This is from a 25 gig plug fest that we did in December of 2016. And basically what we've got here, if you look closely, you're going to see uh, nine different cables and or optics plugged into a single switch. So when we very first started doing this interop program two years ago, we would basically take, if we had a 32 port switch, we would take 32 cables and plug them in all in on every single port. Or, and we'd, or we'd take 32 optics and all plug them in. All the same, all the same model number, all the same brand. Now that's a very thorough way of doing things, but it's just going to take you too long to cover all those combos. So we kind of over time have streamlined things and said, okay, we need to pare this down so it's a little more efficient, but we want to do what we can to not kind of lose the effectiveness of the testing or lose cases, as it were. So we've identified some minimum numbers of cables that we can plug into a particular switch when we're doing these uh, interoperability tests. We need to expand that model that we've basically kind of proven out with networking and expand it to other parts of the OCP community. Servers come to mind. But, but that's the idea. Cast a wide net. Um, don't be too daunted by the fact that there's so many combinations available, but at least try and start and put a dent in that testing and put a dent in that interoperability problem. Next slide. Now the fourth and final problem, or the thing that makes interoperability a challenge in open networking, is what I'm calling the integration resources gap. So Carlos kind of mentioned this. If it doesn't work, who do you call? Well, do you call everybody that you bought from? Do you focus your efforts on the NOS guy? Do you focus your efforts on the hardware guy? That's a question that many end users are having to deal with. On top of that, the effort to actually do the validation, whether it be of the hardware or of the software or of a cable, there's equipment that's necessary to do that. There's expensive test equipment that's necessary to do that. There's expertise that's necessary to do that. There's just plain time that's necessary to do that. And many people may have a few people in the organization that are able to do that, but they don't have the time for it. Or perhaps they don't have the equipment for it. Or maybe if they're even smaller, they don't have the expertise for it. So this is a real problem for end users that are trying to create their own solutions by buying directly from the ODMs and buying directly from the manufacturers. This is a problem that they're running into over and over again. So how do we address this? There's a couple things. Next slide. Uh, so first, we're doing an open solutions validation service at the IOL. Basically, all of the things that we've been learning from doing plug fests and engaging directly with manufacturers and uh, engaging directly with ODMs, um, we've come up with a set of tests that originally was intended to be used by the ODMs and the manufacturers and so forth. But you know what? The end user can actually use that information really well. And so we're opening that up uh, to partner with end users to actually um, let us help them uh, validate their uh, combinations, evaluate their uh, open networking solutions. And so we've already uh, been working with financial institutions on this. We've even been working with some uh, hyperscalers on this as well. So that's one approach, is engage directly with the end user. Next slide. 
Uh, the other approach, of course, is the integrators list. So this integrators list is serving as a starting point for people when making their purchasing decisions. And so uh, we've heard from financials, we've heard from retailers, we've heard from telcos that are all using this open networking integrators list as a reference to understand where they want to start when figuring out what combination of NOS, switch, and module cable they want to use. So that's the open networking integrators list. Next slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so I want to take a, a moment and go back over this kind of two and a half years that at UNHI, well, we've been involved in OCP and, and following this, this phenomenon of, of bare metal switching. It was October 2015 that we actually launched the open networking integrators list. We did that at the engineering workshop at Fidelity in Boston, Massachusetts. That first one was just 10 and 40 gig ethernet. In 2016, uh, we were continued to add products to be eligible for that integrators list. So we added LR optics, we added 100 gig optics, well, we also added 25 gig optics. Uh, we added the 100 gig um, products during the engineering workshop that was actually held at UNH in, in Durham, New Hampshire last summer. And now finally we've gotten here to 2017, we're launching our onetested.org integrators list. We've crossed 100 configurations on the open networking integrators list. We're launching our open solutions validation service. So that's kind of the process that you can see as this kind of interop effort has, has grown and has matured over the last couple of years. Next slide. So we identified four things, and there's probably more, <laughs> right, let's be honest, but four things that make interoperability in an open ecosystem especially challenging. Things that previously, you know, the end user was shielded from. Uh, but we've also identified uh, four solutions for that, for addressing those uh, specific things. Next slide. Now the purpose for all of that is we want people to be able to say, white box, it just works. You know, it's kind of started out the presentation here saying, lots of people have said, hey, because it was open, I thought it would just work. And that's not the reality today, but it doesn't mean it can't be the reality if as a community we actually put the effort into making it a reality instead of kind of hiding from the problem. So we want to be able to say, white box, it just works. Next slide. We want open to equal interoperable. And in fact, we could even say if we're successful, by default, open equals interoperable. That's the goal of this program. That's the goal of all the work that we've put into this uh, integrators list program over the last two years. And I'm Happy to say that I think we've, we've found some success with it and we're starting to see some real uh, traction, especially from end users on that. So, thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, coming out and listening to this. I don't know if there's questions. We have time for that. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, and, and just to make sure I understand your question correctly, you're talking about a, a case where I'm looking at interoperability between an open solution and then maybe a more traditional solution, and there. Okay, all right. <laughs> you know, a lot of the testing that we've defined, um, it would be very easy to drop a more traditional product, you know, take out the open solution and drop the more traditional product right in there and do the test almost the exact same way. Uh, so what I think is going to need to happen there is, you know, for perhaps the more traditional companies to start hearing from people that are implementing open solutions and saying that interoperability with open solutions is a priority, right? Um, there's lots of people that are, in fact, I would probably wager to say most people are using kind of a mixed environment. They've got, you know, a black box and a white box solution in the same network. And, you know, we've focused so far on interoperability amongst white box solutions. Great, right? But reality is people are using these things in, in mixed environment. And I think the kind of the, maybe a next step is for the community outside of OCP to start hearing from the end user that this is a priority, that, 
not just um, interoperability amongst white box is important, but in a mixed environment it's important. If people hear it, you know, if those companies hear that and that starts to be a demand from customers, the testing exists, the program is there, and it's very easy to drop their products right in. So, uh, but we'll need them to, to participate and see that as a priority. Now, of course, there's a tendency to want to protect what they have, but again, if it's a priority from customers, I think you'll see interest from those, from those vendors. That's a good question. Thank you. All right, thanks again for your time. Thank, Thank you, you David.